From the news team at LinkedIn, this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Natalie Kogan is today's guest. About a decade ago, Natalie had a crisis. She was in her mid-30s. She'd had a spectacularly successful career. She was a consultant and then a venture capitalist and then a tech founder. Natalie was married. She had a daughter. She lived outside Boston. And she was working so hard, so hard that she finally hit a wall. So it wasn't just a lot of work. It was not having any boundary between me and my work. I started to black out. Um, I remember, in t- I'm, I'm a talker, I can never shut up, right? I speak for a living. I remember in team meetings, like somebody from the team would like sort of shake my elbow and be like, do you have anything to say? And it was absurd because I had too much to say, but I would just black out. Natalie was burnt out. She was the founder of a startup called Happier, a startup that was all about gratitude. And yet she was so unhappy. This wasn't a take a vacation for a week kind of burnout. Things were bad. Natalie couldn't figure out how to make herself better on her own. And as we all grapple with the lingering effects of the pandemic, I think a lot of you are going to get that. I know our team does. In today's episode, Natalie takes us along on her journey to break free from that burnout. Today, she's thriving, and she thinks that you should be too. She's recorded what she learned in a new book. It's called The Awesome Human Project. And to really get Natalie's approach, you need to understand where she started. So Natalie's a Russian refugee. She moved to the U.S. at age 13. She's always been a worker, an achiever. After college, she landed a great job at McKinsey. And then after a year, she quit. It was a huge deal for a couple of reasons. One, we came with nothing. And here I had this job at McKinsey that was paying me $42,000 a year at the time. And that was more than any of my parents were making. And Yeah, I think it's a, you know, I didn't even think of that. It was a huge deal because I had kind of gotten a break and I was making money and I was like, oh, I'm going to go to a startup and then not have a job. So this is kind of a theme in my career, which again, people always tell me I'm such a risk taker. The thing is, I'm a little like, this is the dichotomy. I think it's true for so many people. I actually really seek stability and safety. I think because of being a refugee, I, I still feel like a refugee. Like I've been here 32 years, nothing has changed. But my next move made my parents surprised, but they exhaled a little bit because I became a venture capitalist without really understanding what venture capital was or knowing that fewer than 6% women are in venture capital. I learned a lot, including the fact that I didn't want to be a venture capitalist because I wanted to build. And so five years later, with a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, um, I left venture capital to start a company called Work at Mom, which was um, the first kind of big online community for working moms, which we grew um, significantly because I, I couldn't find a resource for working moms anywhere. I remember, you'll relate to this, Jesse. I was on a message board. There was a site called... Um, urban baby in New York. It was like a message board. Yeah. And my daughter refused to sleep for the first nine months of her life for any amount longer than 29 minutes, which I found out is a sleep cycle length. So she just would sleep in 29 minute intervals. And one night I was on there just like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And I was like, you know, our nanny can get her to nap for an hour, but I can't get her to sleep. And the first response was, why don't you try being a mother and not having a nanny? Um, And I was like, okay, that hurts. And I was like, hold on, I'd like to talk to other moms who work. So I created this company and we, you know, we had it, it was really great. And then November, 2008 came and we needed to raise more money and no one had any money to give us. So I had to do the really, really painful and hard thing and sell off the assets and look for a job. And this is a theme in my career of, I take a risk and it doesn't work out. I learn something. And then just when I think I'll never do a startup again, I remember screaming this at my poor husband. I'm never doing a startup again. I joined um, a startup that I helped grow really fast that we sold to PayPal. And about a year after, again, having a secure income and paying off all our loans, Yep, I just could not fill that hole in me. And this is when I started doing research on how to be fulfilled and how to feel happier and came across research on gratitude and left PayPal to start happier. Believe it or not, Natalie had already founded Happier when the grind caught up with her. She was 38, and it's important to hear how bad it got. I started to lose part of my days. 
Like I remember playing Connect Four with my daughter and it's so painful for me to say this. And I've said this so many times and I just like remember her face like mama. And I don't know how long I was gone. I wasn't sleeping very much. I was either eating nothing or too much. I was drinking too much red wine or not drinking anything at all. And I just, the, the way that I can describe it is I became a ghost in my life. So I was going through the emotions, but I, I wasn't there in any way. And it was hurting my business. It was hurting my marriage. It was hurting everything. And the turning point for me was not some kind of a eureka where I was like, oh, I need help. I need change. No, because I, I had no awareness. One of my investors, and I do want to give him an incredible shout out because investors get a bad rep. Mike Hirschland, we had a meeting one day and he sat me down and, you know, I was going on about business and he said, listen, I need you to shut up. You are not okay and you need to get help. And I will not speak to you again until you get help, to which I thought was absurd. But he had a point of power in my life because he was a friend, but he also was on my board. And so, you know, everyone tried to help. And the thing I need to tell you, you know, I found out years later, there was actually my husband to whom I was not speaking at the time, who reached out to Mike and said, is there anything you can do? She won't listen to anyone else. And I, I'm really afraid. And so it was an immense act of kindness from Avi, but he knew he couldn't reach me. So Mike wow. kind of forced the issue. Um, and uh, it was very scary. I just want to say that I had to put my company on hold. I had to let go of my team. I had to go to my investors and tell them that I wasn't okay. Um, I had to face things I'd never faced is the biggest gift that the universe could have given me. I, I talk about that experience of it's nothing I would wish on my worst enemy, but it's what I would wish on my best friend because I don't think anything short of that would have paused me to actually begin to consider living a different way. This experience and recovering from it, it inspired Natalie to create her guide to avoid burnout in the future. I wanna share one of her key ideas, which she shares in the book. She writes, you don't need to make dramatic life changes to struggle less and thrive more. You don't need to put that kind of pressure on yourself because overcommitting only sets you up for failure. I asked Natalie how we can set ourselves up to thrive by making minor tweaks in our lives rather than those massive changes. And here's what she had to say. Every day there are articles about the great resignation and people quitting jobs. And I feel like it gives this message that that's the choice, right? You either work and you burn out or you resign and you move to Baja and you don't work. And you know what? I think most of us have kids and mortgages and parents and responsibilities. And I have to tell you, when I re read those articles, I feel kind of offended. Even if I wanted to, I can't pick up. I have parents and all that kind of stuff. So my view is different. And the way that we begin to tweak is by recognizing there is a difference between challenges and stresses on the outside that are absolutely part of daily life. So to me, the big difference is between challenge and struggle. None of us can eliminate challenges in life or should try. It's the feature, not a bug. My tech background comes in, right? <laughs> challenge is a feature of life. It's not a bug. But struggle internal struggle is something that we can reduce. And, and the way that we reduce our inner struggle is by creating a more supportive relationship with ourselves, our thoughts, and our emotions. And this idea of having a relationship with yourself, and it begins with awareness. The awareness is around the fact that we have a reservoir of emotional, mental, physical energy every day, and we have to be aware of where that energy is. Many of us experience daily burnout. So it doesn't have to be this thing that I went through where I just couldn't function, but we all can relate to that feeling at the end of the day, you just on empty, you have nothing else to give. You have exhausted your emotional, mental, and physical energy reservoir. So developing awareness around, well, where is my energy? wow, I'm, I'm, I'm getting really low. Let me pause and do something to fuel myself. As Natalie and I were talking, I started thinking about how I trained for the AIDS ride 20 years ago. It wasn't just get on my bike and go 580 miles from San Francisco to LA. No. Every week I would go on these training rides. I got stronger and stronger and they got longer and longer and finally I had the endurance for the physical challenge. I did that ride, but it's not like I kept up with the physical training, and as a result, I'm not strong enough to do a ride like that anymore. Natalie's framing around how to avoid burnout follows a similar pattern. We can't just solve for the end goal of no more burnout. There are steps we must take to prepare ourselves and to keep fit. We'll have to keep up with them. Here's how Natalie sees this. 
just like you said, to have the emotional fitness to get through life's challenges without burning out or to do work you love without burning out, we have to practice our emotional fitness. And so the skills to give kind of a, an overview. So the five skills are acceptance, gratitude, self-care, intentional kindness, and the bigger why. Acceptance, gratitude, self-care, intentional kindness, the bigger why. According to Natalie, building up our skills in these five areas will help us avoid burnout. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Natalie will show us how to do it. And we're back. In this second half of our conversation, Natalie Kogan takes us through the five skills we need to build up in order to avoid burnout, starting with awareness. So awareness as part of acceptance. Acceptance, the way that I define it, is a skill of learning how to look at the situation ahead of you and how you feel with clarity, which means separating the facts from the stories our brain creates from its negativity bias, its fear of uncertainty, right? Because our brain really doesn't care about our thriving our brain does not care about our happiness. Our brain just wants us to survive. So it's created a lot of filters through which we perceive things which cause a lot of uh, stress and anxiety. So acceptance is about separating all that and looking at this is how it is and this is how I feel. And then using that as the foundation to say, given how this is, what's the next best thing I could do? to truly meet this moment as it is. And it involves taking a lot of responsibility. It's focusing on what you can control versus you can't. The second skill is gratitude. And Natalie compares gratitude to broccoli. Here's why. I think we've all heard about gratitude and we know it's good for us, but knowing that broccoli is good for you doesn't do you any good. You have to eat the broccoli. So I invite people to think of gratitude as a skill you practice daily. And it's a skill of Zooming in on the small things in your life that are good or meaningful or joyful or comforting or kind or just okay, even when things are challenging, because our brain only wants to focus on what's wrong because it has a negativity bias. And so we have to help balance out the emotional picture of our lives by reminding ourselves of what we're grateful for. The third skill is self-care. Natalie encounters objections around this one, guilt and time. She hopes her definition breaks through those feelings. The way that I define self-care is it is a skill of fueling your emotional, mental, and physical energy. Take example of a car, right? A car needs gas or electricity to do its job of being a car. When the car runs out of gas, we go and fill up the car. We don't sit there and go, well, does the car deserve to be filled up with gas? Do I have time to fill up my empty car? None of us ask that because we know it's essential, but yet we treat our energy that way, right? How many of our listeners right now have been, it's midnight and you're exhausted, but you're plowing through your emails because you just got to do it. And so self-care is a skill of becoming aware of and intentionally fueling our emotional, mental, and physical energy. Self-care gets such a bad rap in our culture. Right? It's terrible. It's all about luxury and money and buying things. You don't need to buy a single thing to practice self-care, but you do need to take responsibility and awareness of your energy level. And it doesn't cost money to fuel up. You yeah. know, I teach this practice to companies and teams and leaders of a 15-minute daily fuel up. And this is actually one of the practices I'd love to offer. Make 15 minutes um, as an appointment with yourself every day. Put it on your calendar. It doesn't have to be the same time every day. 15 minutes, this is your daily fuel up. And when it comes, ask yourself, first check in with yourself, just like you would with a friend or a loved one, right? We say, hey, how are you? How are you feeling? Say that to yourself. None of, most of us don't do that, but it allows you to gain that awareness. And then based on how you feel, Ask yourself, what is something I could do right now, given where I am, what's going on, my constraints? What is something I could do to fuel my energy? The challenge there for me, and I bet for a lot of people, is not being actually able to answer that question. Like, what do you like to do for yourself? I don't know. I've got a three-year-old. I've got a nine-month-old who never sleeps. I don't know. I have a podcast to make. I I've got work. Like, what do I like to do for myself? I love that you just said this because you are not alone. When I started to ask myself this question, I had no answer. I was, I was brought up with the idea that to do something for yourself is the most horrible c crime you can commit against your family. And I, can, I work with so many leaders and executives and working moms. And so many people say, Natalie, I don't know my answer to that. 
that's your first job, your first responsibility. And I offer this as a little brainstorm. Have a little five minute brainstorm with yourself. Take out a post-it note or a piece of paper and just jot down as many things as you can think of that bring you joy, that make you feel good, that fuel your energy. And I get busy. We're all busy. Two kids, elderly parents, jobs. We all have 15 minutes because things I'm talking about are a five to 10 minute walk outside. Research shows dramatically improves your energy, boosts your mood, um, improves focus and motivation. Um, sometimes for me, what fuels me because I do so much talking is there's a chair in the corner of my office and I get a cup of tea and I just sit there for 10 minutes. It might just be doing some stretches, but have a little brainstorm with yourself. This is such a gift you can give, not just to yourself, but the way that I look at self-care, it's the opposite of selfish. It is your responsibility to the people you love and your work because you cannot give what you don't have. And that leads us to number four, intentional kindness. When I say this on stage, I get these looks of like, we're going to talk about kindness as a skill. Like we all know kindness is good for us. Random act of kindness. Like what? The thing is, it's kind of like gratitude. We all, I think, know kindness is important, but it gets lost in the busy, in the stressed. So the skill of kindness is about doing something to elevate or support or help another person and not expect anything in return. And the reason it's so essential is as human beings, one of our core human needs is to feel like we are connected, like we belong. We actually cannot function anywhere near our potential if we feel isolated, which is different from spending time alone just to refuel, especially right now with everything going on. And the best way that we can fuel those human connections is with kindness, right? And the simplest act of kindness is to check in, just like I just talked about checking in on yourself to check in with a friend or a colleague, to ask them how they are and to be there to listen. Kindness is also compassion, which means somebody does something that's annoying and instead of flying off the handle, which I'm raising my hand right now, listeners can't see me, but that's my instinct, right? Right. Someone does something annoying, I just want to retaliate. Well, compassion means I pause for a moment and I think about, wow, this person might be struggling with something I have no idea about. And What can I do to kind of not further the suffering? Oh, let me not fly off the handle. So Natalie, I have to tell you, you know, I've just read your book. I knew that we were going to talk today and it came at an opportune time uh, because yesterday our our three-year-old was diagnosed with COVID, which is Mm. an experience that I think a lot of our listeners are probably having this year if they haven't had it already. And what that means for my family is that we sent our child care home and my wife and I are now going to spend the next two weeks, basically, um, between my son and my daughter, and maybe I'll get sick, maybe she'll get sick, uh, in this house, figuring out how to care for our children Mm. and work together. And and I took that kindness piece to heart, and I decided I was going to offer myself the challenge of figuring out, without telling my wife this, um, how I could be as kind as possible. Mm. Because we're working really hard. We are, and we're short with each other. And by the way, there's nobody that I'd like to be in the trenches with more than my wife. She's really good at working. We can get the laundry done and the food made and we can get the kids down for their naps and we can we can do that, right? But adding that layer of introducing like pro proactive kindness totally shifts the way that it feels to be yes. together. Yes. Because what's what you're doing by making kindness a priority is um, you're tapping into the best of you, right? We are actually meant to be kind. The human brain releases oxytocin and serotonin when we do something kind. Our brain wants us to be kind. It rewards us with neurotransmitters that feel good. But I also believe it, it, it brings the best of ourselves forward because when we do something kind towards another person, we are connecting to that idea that we're all connected. We are one. In a way, you guys are one unit. And by having that as your priority, you're bringing the best of you out, which brings the best of your wife out. But when I went through my burnout and really it was kind of a breakdown, you know, when you have darkness inside, it, it affects everything. And it affected my marriage. I mean, my husband and I have been together for a really long time. We met in college. Um, I'm 46. We've been together for 26 years. So we'd already lived many lives together, but our marriage was in a horrible state because we weren't speaking to each other. Uh, We were parenting our daughter, Mia, uh, but we weren't speaking to each other. It was really in a place where I didn't know if we were going to go forward. And my teacher, who I met at the time, who was my teacher for a couple of years, said to me, 
I want you to be kind to Avi. To which I immediately replied, okay, this is a ridiculous idea because no, no, no. First, we have to do the math. He has done all these things to hurt me and I've done all these things to hurt him. And I wanted to do this relationship math of who has done the most things to hurt each other and then who has to go first, right? Which is, you know, thank you for smiling. It's ridiculous, but I know a lot of people relate. Relationship math is like a fast, it's, it, it, it's, it is math that never adds up. It Ever. never adds up. And mm-hmm. my teacher said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not asking you to be kind for him. I'm asking you to be kind for yourself. You experience 100% of the emotions you give to others. And I want you to practice trying to be kind to Avi for you so you can get to a place where you feel like you're bringing the best of you. And it was really hard because we had gotten to this place where kindness was the furthest from our minds. But I tried and I have to give Avi tremendous credit because he tried to. And by the way, just to be really honest, it involved basic things like texting him to see how he was because I hadn't done that in years because, you know, we built up these walls, right? Yeah. And I write about this in my first book, Happier Now, that when people ask us, how did we walk our marriage back from a really dark place to be each other best friends? And my answer is kindness. No grandiose acts. And it melted the ice. And over time, it weaved this new fabric between us. When we have the intention of being kind, that's the best of us. The final skill is what Natalie calls the bigger why. It's all about connecting to purpose. But that doesn't mean going out to find new things to do. Often we think of purpose as being something out there that you have to go to find connect things that you're already doing, the laundry, that project, that presentation, that annoying report at work, to how does it contribute to others? Because that is where most of us connect to our sense of purpose. Like when you get that done, who does it help? And when you answer that question, you have connected this to do to something that is meaningful. And when we connect to a sense of purpose as human beings, we enter what's called a pro-social mindset. It helps us better manage stress. It actually allows us to fuel our energy in the right direction. And there you have it. Five skills for your mental personal training session. Five skills to really, truly help you abandon burnout. Of course, Natalie Kogan builds on all of this in her book, The Awesome Human Project. Be sure to check it out. We've been talking about reinvention at Hello Monday for a month now. One of the things you don't always hear is that I'm asking every guest the same question. What does reinvention mean to you in your life and work? Natalie's answer puts such a nice button on our conversation that I wanted to share it with you. The idea of reinvention for me is to reinvent the way that we think about challenge and struggle in life and to reinvent our relationship with ourselves so that we can struggle less even when life is really challenging. And to me, that reinvention is really inner focused. It is again, to shift the way that we treat ourselves to create a more supportive relationship with ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, and other people, because the way we treat others is rooted in the way that we treat ourselves. So to me, if we could undertake that reinvention project, I think that we truly unleash our greatest capacity and potential to do all the things on the outside that are meaningful to us. That was Natalie Kogan. Burnout is something that affects so many people. I definitely have moments where I feel absolutely drained. Budgeting our stress is so important. Just living and going through your days, fulfilling obligations, completing tasks, without doing things that bring you joy or fulfill you, it's not sustainable. It's how we all get burnt out. So this week on Office Hours, I want you to bring some actionable items that you can do daily to help you avoid burnout. Maybe it's replying to emails at specific times only, instead of being available all day. The goal here is for you to replace that stressor and do something that brings you joy. Maybe that's a moment of quiet with your coffee. Whatever it is, I hope you'll share it with us. And if you're feeling burned out, tell us. I promise you're not alone. We'll go live from the LinkedIn news page at 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. And as always, if you like the show, please rate and review us. It helps us so much. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Taisha Henry, Michelle O'Brien, and Derek Carl. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer, Victoria Taylor, and Ginny Choi are not afraid. Or at least they front like it. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. 
Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We're back next Monday. Thanks for listening. Stop pulling that, dude. Sorry, pause one second. My son my son is pulling the cord out of my computer. I kid you not. Guys, sorry. Hold up. I'm just going to go to the source of this problem and deal with it. Pause. Oh, go, go. I'm here. Jude Rally. Listen, Jess, Jesse, I'm a working mom, so please. And I know I have a teenager now, so different issues. But the fact that my school right now is what's saving us. Otherwise, there'd be some kind of an emergency where she must have it solved right now. And she would be here. Be like, guys, I'm sorry, but mom, oh, my God. Yeah.